What's up rockers? So literally a year ago, I found this junk PC engine being sold on Facebook Marketplace for 35 bucks shipped. Even better, Daniel was selling it who I've dealt with extensively in the past and had plenty of great transactions with him. So for $35 shipped from Japan, I kind of thought to myself, well, how bad could this thing realistically be? I mean, the pictures don't make it look great, but I've long wanted a PC engine of my own and this seemed like the perfect time to pick one up. Well, little did I know that this little gem would take six months to get to me, as flight traffic from Japan to the US hit a virtual standstill due to COVID, and this little PC engine had to wait its turn to get a flight across the pond. So here we are, one year after the purchase of this console, and let's just say junk is a very accurate way of describing this console. I mean, it is absolutely caked in dirt and grime, and it's pretty nasty. But I wanted a PC engine, so let's see what we can do to get this thing restored and hopefully looking like new again. The PC engine is well known for having an awesome library of shooters on it, and there are many that I'm excited to be able to play on real hardware for the first time and not just emulate. R-Type is one of those games that I've played extensively on emulator, and I'm so close to being able to play it on real hardware. This is super exciting, so let's fire this thing up and see if it actually works. <sighs> well, that should surprise absolutely nobody. I mean, this thing was labeled junk after all. So the first thing I'm going to do is make sure it's getting power and this needs 9 volts of DC power, center tip negative, so just going to get my multimeter and make sure that the power cable is not the issue and looks like the power cable is working exactly as it's supposed to as it's providing 9 volts to the console. The problem is there's not even an LED on this thing so I have no idea if it's actually getting to the point where the console is powering on. So let's rip this thing open and let's start investigating what the potential issue could be here. Ugh, man, taking a look at the inside of this thing, it is nasty. There's a lot of uncleaned up flux and I don't know, maybe, maybe even like a little bit of soda in there. It's, it's pretty disgusting. Now, I don't have a ton of experience working on PC engines as this is my first one, but whew, man, they did not do a good job of cleaning up all that flux. So what I'm going to do is start by getting this thing all cleaned up because it's nasty. So to clean up this board, I'm going to use some 99% isopropyl alcohol or IPA. And I'm going to use some Q-tips as well as a toothbrush to really sit there and scrub it all off the PCB. Not only does this flux just obviously look nasty, but it's also good at trapping dust in there as well as can have a corrosive impact on the board depending on the nature of the flux used. So obviously we want this stuff out of here. My guess is it's probably not corrosive considering the fact that NEC would have likely removed it all prior to distributing it to customers, but hey, you just never know. So let's just get this stuff out of here and get the board nice and cleaned up. So while I was doing all that cleaning on the board, I kind of noticed that the 7805 regulator, which regulates the 9 volts down to the 5.5 volts used by the console, looked really crusty. So I'm just going to go ahead and hook up my multimeter to it and test and see if it's working correctly. And it looks like it's getting no power. So the issue likely lies somewhere before it gets to the 7805 regulator. And honestly, kind of looking at that fuse next to it, I think I've identified the issue. It looks like it's broken, so I'm just going to test continuity on it, and sure enough, there's no continuity, which means the fuse is blown. So with the issue identified, let's just go ahead and remove this legacy fuse. Now, it's a through-hole component, so obviously you can desolder it from the back of the board as well, but I'm just going to go ahead and add a little bit of flux and a little bit of heat here using my soldering iron, and obviously just uh, go ahead and remove that with my tweezer. Gonna do the same thing on the other side and the part should just pop right out. All 
All right, with that fuse out, I'm just gonna go ahead and tin up these through hole pads and I'm almost gonna treat this thing as like an SMD component. Now, I don't actually have the exact fuse that was used in this, so I kind of converted over a Super Nintendo Pico fuse. The only downside to doing it like this is technically the fuse that was in here was a 1.5 amp 125 volt fuse and this one's a 1.5 amp fuse. Again, I don't think it's going to make a big difference here, but if I'm able to find the actual fuse that was used in this console a little bit later on, I'll be certain to replace this when the time comes. Okay, with that old fuse out and the new one in, I think it's time to test it again. So I'm going to pop in R-Type and let's fire up the console and hopefully the game plays. Boom! Looks like we got signs of life. All right, next we got to test out this controller because I'm not going to lie, that D-pad does not feel right. It's almost like the membrane is either non-existent or completely broken. But before we get into actually fixing it, let's uh, fire up the game and see what happens. And sure enough, it looks like the game's booting no problem, and we're able to test out some of the other buttons. Obviously, the run button works, and the 1 and 2 buttons work, but yeah, that, I don't suck this bad. That D-pad doesn't work at all. So I'm going to rip this controller open by removing the five Phillips head screws on the back of the controller shell and get inside and take a look. Like I said, it feels like there's no silicon pad there at all, so I have a feeling that's my issue. And sure enough, opening up the controller, that's exactly what it is. It's completely missing. Now, fortunately, I picked up a nice tip from Gadget UK and his YouTube channel, which is that the... The PC Engine is compatible with all NES original silicon membranes. So I've got a replacement D-pad from an NES shell and I just got to make a small modification to it to make it work which is just to snip off that little corner that I marked out. Pretty easy to do, just going to take my flush cuts and square that up and we should be good to go. All right, with those all replaced, let's fire up the console and give it one more test and hopefully we can actually play the game and sure enough, it works. Awesome. Now, the controller is still pretty nasty and there's other stuff we're gonna need to do to it. So for example, the other membranes are, are just kind of gross. They're covered in dirt and grime. So let's go ahead and use some isopropyl alcohol, some Q-tips, and let's get those all cleaned up really nice so the whole controller is feeling real fresh. Well, good news is we got a working console and working controller, but uh, I'm not going to lie, this thing is still super nasty. I mean, the actual plastics of both the console and the controller shell are totally nasty. So I'm just going to clean them up a little bit. I've got a nice soft bristle brush and my Dawn soap, and let's go ahead and get a bucket together and start cleaning all this up. Basically, I'm going to use this larger brush to take away a lot of the outside kind of grime and nastiness, and then I'm going to get into some of the finer detail with a toothbrush and the goal here is just really to get all of that you know dirt and grime that's been built up on this thing forever out we're not going to remove the yellowing quite yet we'll get to that in a little bit but for now let's just get this thing really really nice so when we go ahead and retro bright this thing later on there won't be any dirt or grime left over which will have hidden yellow that won't be removed by the retro brighting process All right, so those shells are finally fresh and clean, and now it's time for a little bit of Retro Bright. So I use this Salon Cream 40 that I get from Sally Beauty. It works really well. I know a lot of people go for a more submerged method using a similar, like more liquid product. 
This is kind of just the way I've always done it, and I'm very familiar with the process, so this is just the way I'm going to do it. I know a lot of others will, like I said, go for the submerged experience because it gets you probably a little bit less streaking or potential for streaking, but again, this is the way I do it. If you want, you can take a look at the card in the upper right hand corner, and I'll kind of leave a link to my retro writing setup. Uh, basically, I'm going to use that exact same setup here. The only difference is, is I'm not going to add any heating element to this one because I just don't have the time to monitor it as closely as I'd like. So using a non-heated version obviously slows the process down and allows me a little bit more time between each right retro bright session to know exactly what I'm looking at. But anyway, I'm going to take a, a little bit of a chip brush here and I'm just going to really take my time to brush the salon cream into each of the grooves and all of the detail on the actual console here. The goal is to get it as spread around as best I can and get it into all those tiny details so everything retro brights as evenly as possible. Now, based on just kind of looking at this thing, this shell is going to take, oh, if I had to guess, at least 48 hours. So I'm going to have to probably reapply the cream here. Typically, I do that about every 8 to 10 hours. So I'll reapply that several times to get this as good as I can. As far as the bottom shell and the controller, it's in a little bit better condition. So I'm just kind of estimating it's going to take a little bit less time. My guess is somewhere in the neighborhood of, I don't know, 12 to 48 hours for each. So. Anyway, let's go ahead and get the rest of this uh, Salon Cream 40 on there and get it all into these bags and then into the Retrobrite box. So with those parts in the Retrobrite box, I had a little bit of extra time. And that led to me doing some thinking, and thinking specifically about that power slider. And the reality is, is the power slider on this console is kind of, well, sad for lack of better words. I mean, instead of going with an LED, it has an orange sticker. I mean, come on, that's kind of weak. So here's my thought. Let's make a mold of it, and let's cast it in a nice transparent green, and do our best to get it as close to the original color as we can. And then obviously we can add an LED, so when the console's actually turned on, you can tell it's getting power, and the LED will turn on, and in theory, shine through this casted new power slider. So anyway, let's go ahead and get some silicone poured, and let's go from there. Okay, with that first half of the mold poured and complete, just make sure you're adding plenty of mold release to your mold, because you don't want to end up with a silicone brick instead of a mold. But anyway, if you're interested in learning more about the molding and casting process, make sure you check out the card in the upper right hand corner, as I've done a full tutorial on it before. And while not specific to this part, it'll at least give you a pretty good idea of where to go and how to do it yourself. Okay, and with that second half of the mold complete, I'm just going to go ahead and pop this thing out of the mold box and slowly pry open the sides of the silicone mold. I want to make sure I don't go too quickly so I don't rip the silicone or damage it in any way. And with it open, I'm going to have an opportunity to remove the master and take a look at the mold. And honestly, it looks really good. So for our resin today, we're going to be using this Alumilite clear resin. This stuff is fantastic at producing clear or semi-transparent parts. And we're going to tint it with a little bit of green and do our best to get it to match the original part color. Admittedly, it's not perfect. It's probably a little bit on the neon side, but hey, we're going to get it as close as we can. If you're interested in trying out some of this Alumilite resin for yourself, make sure you check out the affiliate link in the description below. All right, with both parts of the resin mixed together and our pigment all in there, I'm gonna go ahead and inject that resin into the mold we just created, and then I'm gonna subject it to the pressure pot and put it under approximately 60 pounds of pressure, and this thing will probably be ready in about three or four hours. So let's go ahead and get it in there, and let's see how we did. All right, so I've got all that resin in the pressure pot and it's gonna cure in there for the next, you know, four-ish hours or so. So in the meantime, it's time to get this LED installed. I'm just going for a very basic red LED and I'm gonna hook it up to this 7805 voltage regulator and I've got it all wired up for five volts and here you go. We got the part out of the pressure pot and we're just gonna go ahead and install it right here. And you can see it's semi-transparent. Again, coloring's not absolutely perfect, but hey, it's, it's by far close enough. But uh, with that done and all the parts done retro brighting, I think we're at the point now where it's just time to reassemble everything, put it all back together, and then check out how we did.
And after all that work, here's what it looks like. Overall, this console turned out absolutely awesome. The Retrobrite worked really, really well. Got a nice overall white aesthetic on the console with no streaking, which is always a good thing. The controller looks and works great. And more importantly, I'm really happy with the way the casted parts turned out. I even went a little bit crazy with the AV booster and 3D printed an awesome enclosure for it. I went real crazy and even went the matching white and red color scheme, but uh, hey, it is what it is. I thought it would look great. But as great as this thing looks, really the most important thing is how does it play? So let's fire it up. There we go. Been waiting a really long time to play this on my CRT. And if you see any scrolling lines, don't worry about it. That's just the refresh between the camera and the CRT just being slightly different. And I know the colors look a little washed here when recording with my phone, but I'll tell you what, in person, they look vivid and they look really good. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you check out this one here at the end and make sure you give me a comment, like, and subscribe. Talk to you guys later and catch you for the next one here soon.